It's good to see some unfamiliar and new faces and to think about all the faces that are watching or will be watching, whether now or later. Uh, I just want to start by saying I'm glad that Paul Shaw got a haircut because I was beginning to wonder who it was sitting next to Linda back there all these weeks, but uh, it's good to have everybody here. <laughs> Michael is clapping as well. Um, welcome to our service of worship. I have some, some announcements and some prayer concerns to share. Uh, first of all, we're having a blood drive on the sidewalk out in front of the church this coming Wednesday evening. Um, if you haven't heard about that already, uh, please consider. I know I see some faces here of the names that I was given a list of people who have donated in the past. It's an interesting decision these days, isn't it, about whether to, uh, to come in and donate blood, uh, given the times we're in. But on the other hand, there, there may perhaps not be a safer place to be than a place being run by medical, medically trained folks. And um, I, for one, am going to, to donate. I've made that choice myself. Um, I encourage you to think about that. You need to make an appointment in advance, and you do so online. So if you have uh, a desire to help with this but don't know how to do it, contact Sarah Kelsheimer in the church office, and she will help you with that. Uh, also, uh, this, this afternoon, right after church, we have the most important single ministry of the congregation taking place, the Fantasy Football League. And uh, it's, it's just some of us will be here, a few of us will, but uh, again, given these times in which we live, there will be others participating on their computers at home it's actually a, a fun thing, a bunch of guys getting together and having fun and giving each other a hard time through the church. It's not, nothing to do with God, but it is a fun thing to do just the same. Um, the, on the 11th of this month, the Wadsworths have graciously decided to uh, invite the church to come over in the e evening, that's a Friday, and to have fellowship, bring your own food. Uh, to eat, and maybe there'll be some games to play and things like that. We're, I don't know if they'll be organized, but if you have, we, we'll probably bring our bocce set and things like that to, to play. Uh, that's the 11th. On, uh, uh, oh, last week I made a mistake. Uh, uh, it was good to get it out of the way, too. Um, la last week during the announcements, I said that the McKee Scholarship is the one that's available to all the college students. I was both wrong and right. It is available, but only one of them is awarded each year. It's uh, so through, uh, I think, uh, September 3rd or 4th is the deadline. I wouldn't wait. If you're, if you're connected to a college student who's connected to this church and would like to apply for that, it's a fairly nice amount of money, and uh, it would be worthwhile for anybody to try to, to uh, compete for that one McKee scholarship. Finally, we have a couple of volunteer opportunities that Kelly Stinnett is asking for uh, people to consider. Again, given the, the situation in which we're living now, it's a, it's a hard thing to do sometimes, but um, one of them is to help the Salvation Army with their uh, food giveaways, and the other is to house an international student. Uh, if you have any interest in, in helping with either of those things, please contact Kelly Stinnett and or the church office and we'll reroute you to Kelly. Uh, for our prayer concerns this morning, we have congratulations for a formal, former nursery worker, Danielle Owens Timmons and her husband Jack. They had a baby girl uh, just a couple of days ago. Her name is Veronica Lou, and everybody is healthy. Praise God. Um, also, we're being asked to pray for our community members and our leaders especially as we continue to face decisions and to face challenges of leadership, as we see what's happening in our nation and the escalation, the intensification of what's happening. There was another murder last night in, a, in a Portland, Oregon, and um, it's just getting to be more and more frightening and more and more difficult. So please join me in praying for people who have accountability and responsibility in these times and for all of us to deal with the, the frustrations and the fatigue that are setting in over the months and months of shutdown. So those are our prayer concerns and announcements. Let us now turn and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One additional announcement before I begin is you may have noticed in the bulletin that Logan Williams is listed as the soloist and there's no Logan. He was at a gathering, I believe, last Thursday, 
and one of the individuals there tested positive for COVID, so he is currently in 14 days isolation. So you'll have to put up with me singing a little bit, not nearly as well, but I shall attempt. Let us pray. All-powerful God, your only son came to earth in the form of a slave and is now enthroned at your right hand where he rules in glory. As he reigns as king in our hearts, may we rejoice in his peace, glory in his justice, and live in his love. For with you and the Holy Spirit, he rules now and forever. Amen. In our call to confession, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Let us confess our sins before God. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things we ought to have done, and we have done those things we ought not to have done. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to the world in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh merciful God, for his sake, that we might live a holy, just, and humble life for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. If we have died to sin with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
And now, may the peace of our Lord be with you. And this is the time in our service that is especially key for the children. Now, all of us have been dealing, like Logan is now dealing with, all of us have been dealing with times of being isolated and being somewhat removed from the people we want to be closer to. Uh, and especially children, I think you can find that you've, you've probably spent a lot of time uh, in your homes with your families and maybe getting bored and tired and frustrated. But I have a question for the children. For those of you who are watching either live or watching uh, via a later production, a later production, I wonder, did, have any of you picked up a new hobby since you had to start staying home full time? So if you're watching via the Facebook Live broadcast, go ahead. Mr. Rakup has agreed to shout out your answers if you send them in. And if you're watching via the recording, go ahead and send an email to the church later. I'd really like to know if any of you have new hobbies. And while we're here, I'm just going to ask if any of the folks who are here in the sanctuary this morning have picked up any new hobbies during this time of isolation. Anyone? Any new hobbies? I started something I haven't done before. I'm dusting my house a lot. Do you know your furniture looks really, really good when you dust it every week? It's pretty amazing. <laughs> well, if we hear any hobbies, I'll let them yell out while I start, but I'm gonna tell you about a time, some time ago, when there was a similar situation. Oh, we have one, yeah? Brother, is cooking delicious foods for us. Rowan is cooking delicious foods for her family. Hey, that's a good hobby to pick up, something new and different. That's pretty cool. Another one? He's learning nothing. <laughs> yes. Oh, Nancy Ruby has made a lot of the masks that people are wearing. So new hobbies. This is this is just really a neat thing to have. So um, I'm going to tell you about a family member of mine. My grandfather. Um, when he was 18, he had a time of imposed isolation. When he was 18, he took on a job with the railroad. And when he was with the railroad, well, very early in his career with the railroad, there was an accident and he broke his leg and it was a major break. Now in the 1920s when people broke a leg, it was a big deal. Um, and he ended up being in, in, he had to stay in bed and stay home for about six months. This is an 18-year-old young man. You know, the idea of staying home this whole time, I assure you, he got bored and he got frustrated. But a neighbor gave him a gift. A neighbor gave him some paints and brushes and said, well, maybe you could paint a picture while you are you know, here in isolation. It might help you pass the time. Grandpa didn't have any canvases, so he actually painted a picture on the back of some brown wrapping paper. And the picture he painted was of two deer with some pine trees in the back forest. And every day of my life when I was growing up, I saw that painting because it turns out my grandpa was a very good painter. You see, the neighbor had given him this gift of paints and brushes, but God had given my grandfather the gift of talent, a talent to paint. And my grandfather painted I, that, I have two images of my grandfather. Uh, I remember his 20-minute prayers before family Thanksgiving dinner. And I remember him painting, sitting at the table and painting. Grandpa painted for everybody. Every one of his seven children have a beautiful, had a beautiful painting in their houses. 
And every time, I'm one of 18 grandchildren, every time one of us got married, Grandpa gave us a painting. And I had the privilege of living with my grandparents during my junior year of high school, and every time I came home from school after dinner, Grandpa would sit at the table and paint. And that's the image I have of him. I have several paintings. So, so God gave Grandpa this gift, and Grandpa gave it back to several people. He painted his whole life. I'm going to share with you a painting that I have in my house in a place of honor. This is a painting. My grandfather and my grandparents would go traveling, and they would take pictures in the summer, and then in the winter, my grandpa would paint the pictures. And this is one I have on my wall, and this is the very last painting my grandpa ever worked on. I know because it's not finished. He has the signature in the lower right-hand corner, but it's in pencil, not painted over. He didn't paint his signature until he was done and satisfied. And also, when I look at the, uh, the veins of the windmill, the sky around here is not well blended. He doesn't have the detail in the reflections in the water. I know it's not finished because I've seen others of my grandpa's painting. And every time I look at my grandfather's paintings, it brings me joy. God gave my grandfather a gift of the talent to paint. And my grandfather gave it back and brought joy to so many people for so many years. So if any of the hobbies that you picked up while you were in this time of isolation, if you discovered you have a talent for something you didn't know you have a talent for, know that talent is a gift from God. But what you do with that talent, that's your gift back to God. Let's say a prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the many talents that you give us. We thank you for the opportunity to share those talents with people around us, to bring them joy, and to do your work. Help us, God, to take the talents that you've given us and give them right back to you. Amen. The scripture reading this morning, the first scripture reading is from Proverbs. May God bless the reading of his word to our souls. If your enemies are hungry, give them bread to eat. And if they are thirsty, give them water to drink. For you will heap coals of fire on their heads, and the Lord will reward you.
A few moments ago, I fell into one of the oldest traps in the book. I, I thanked one person who's done something for the church and didn't mention that there were others who have done that very thing. I know Nancy and others have also made masks, and uh, I actually wear one that Nancy made almost every day. So we really appreciate your giving that gift back. Thank you very much. Um, our New Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. Romans 12, 9, listen now for the word of God. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, but be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We are neither wise enough nor good enough to punish our enemies justly. So it reads a note in my study Bible appended to Romans 12, 19. We are neither wise enough nor good enough to punish our enemies justly. Today, when so many see enemies behind every bush, this point has incredible importance. Some see enemies with black skin. Others with white. Some see enemies of the elephant persuasion. Others of the donkey. But we are neither wise enough nor good enough to punish our enemies justly. No, as the verse itself says, punishment for evil belongs to the Lord and the Lord alone. Let God do God. We have enough to worry about just trying to do ourselves. Romans 12, 9 through 18, reads like the Desiderata, that poem by Terre Haute's own Max Ehrman. Let love be genu genuine, the Apostle Paul writes. Neither be cynical about love, for in the face of all its aridity and disenchantment, love is as perennial as the grass, writes Ehrman. Never flag in zeal, writes Paul. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans, Ehrman writes. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer, Paul writes. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune. Do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness, writes Ehrman. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all, Paul writes. As far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons, writes Herman. Great godly advice all around. By the time these two wrote their words, they had each become an old man. Paul was around 60 when he wrote Romans, which was an advanced age for those days. 
Ehrman wrote all of his poetry late in life, and he published none of it before he died. Both of these pieces just drip with wisdom, the perspective, the insight that very rarely, if ever, is accomplished by the young. If we rummage around a little beneath the surface of their works, we also find a common theme, and that is that living wisely is hard. It takes work. It takes strength. It takes the insight and the energy not to do certain things we feel sorely tempted to do. My friend Matt coached football at the high school our children attended. He had a big fire hydrant shaped body. He would played offensive line in Central Michigan and at the age of 45 he looked like he could still knock any man on his bottom. Matt told me that the hardest part of his job was not lashing out at his players' parents. Early in his career, the fathers had been the problem. But by the turn of this century, the mothers had gotten just as bad. The things they would yell at him from the stands where his wife Kim sat. The things they would tell their sons the things they would do at award banquets and practices, the parents. Matt was a deeply faithful Christian, and he knew he was called not to respond in kind, and he did not. But it took a toll on him. And when one mom launched a campaign against Kim on social media, it became the straw that broke his back. He quit coaching. He was a very successful coach. If our son had been inclined to play football, I would have been delighted to have him play for Matt. But he feared that if he stayed on, he might eventually snap and say or do something unforgivable. Taking the high road took too much from him for him to continue. This sermon carries the title, There Is No Try, only do. There is no try, only do. This is inspired by a famous scene in The Empire Strikes Back, episode five of the Star Wars saga. Master Yoda is pushing his young protege, Luke Skywalker, to develop the force within him. And Luke is not progressing well. He's losing confidence in his abilities, his potential. Yoda expresses impatience with this attitude. All right, Luke says. I'll try. No, Yoda answers. Do or not do, there is no try. A momentary pause. Though I am about to exegete a quote from Star Wars, I am not one of those people who finds deep existential profound meaning in these movies, nor, God forbid, Star Trek. And now, having offended half of you, I want to return to the point. Of course, living a godly life requires effort. There is try. But try is only the means. It is not the end. Do is the end. Do is the purpose. Yoda wants Skywalker to keep trying, keep making the effort, until he becomes proficient at using the powers given to him. The Apostle Paul and Max Ehrman would have agreed. Living a meaningful, godly life is hard. Yet the work is not the point. It is the means to the end. It is the way to the point. And the point is this. Becoming the people God calls us to be. Becoming more like Jesus. To do what godly people do or not to do what godly people do not do. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, Paul writes, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Not taking it out on some of our enemies, our perceived enemies, is some of the hardest work we will ever be called to do, as my friend Matt, the football coach, discovered. Yet answering this call, to gain that Christ-like ability not 
to do what we should not do empowers us to live wisely. It empowers us to love and to honor others. It empowers us to glow in the spirit, Paul says, to have a genuine spiritual life. It empowers us to rejoice, to be patient, constant in prayer, generous, sympathetic. In these times, when angry people on all sides seek to inflame and to injure people they see as hated enemies, answering the call of God gives us the strength not to do it. To become more like Jesus and not to lash out in return. There is no try. Only do. The end result is the point. Becoming more Christ-like is the point. Yes, doing takes trying. But Paul gives us an absolute standard. Either we clear the bar or we don't. We don't get participation trophies. And thank God. Because a little bit earlier in Romans, Paul had written, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If we got what we earned, we'd get nothing. We'd get worse than nothing. No, no. The object of our trying is not to win or to place or even to show. It is to do what God calls us to do. And God will forgive us. And God will gift us. And God will take care of us when we make that effort. When we overcome evil with good by not doing things we'd really like to do. In the darkest parts of our hearts and minds. Today, our nation, and indeed all creation, desperately need more people doing what God calls them to do and not doing what God calls them not to do. Now, before I start on my application of all of this to today's world, I want to make a point. I draw a distinction between the people that I see as legitimately protesting an actual grievance out in the world today. There are people out there from conviction, from conscience, who are protesting the ongoing horrible treatment of people of color in our nation. I support them. There's another group of people out there who are using that first group as cover. They're out there taking advantage of the situation to steal things and or to create chaos in the pursuit of an agenda with which I completely disagree. I'm going to be speaking about that specific group of people in a moment. Not the people who are legitimately out there protesting racial issues. My own son and his fiancée are among these people. They've gone to these demonstrations. Good for them. It's the other folks I'm going to be talking about. The other night, as the Republican National Convention ended, or its reasonable facsimile thereof, a number of people who had been invited inside the White House that night, including several who spoke as a part of the convention, after it was all over, they walked out into the streets of Washington, D.C. They probably should have thought more carefully before they did that. Because as soon as they hit the streets, mobs surrounded them. They screamed in their faces, sometimes using bullhorns. They pushed and slapped them. Several of them knocked their enemies to the pavement. One little mob stole an elderly man's walker. There he stood in the center of F Street, urgently needing somehow to get out of there, but they would not allow him to go. I would bet a month's salary that none of them who threatened him and his wife had any idea who they were. After I saw the video, I had no idea who they were. It took a little bit of effort for me. I found out eventually who they were. And even after I knew their names and what, the, what he had done for a living and what she had done for a living, I still didn't know who they were. Not really. That wasn't the point, of course. The point was to hurt our enemies. 
No cause, no protest makes this acceptable. God does not honor this brand of vengeance. Three days before, a young man named Kyle Rittenhouse from the polar opposite end of the political spectrum <clears throat> as those mobs in D.C. Rittenhouse drove from suburban Chicago to Kenosha, Wisconsin. He spent a few afternoon hours helping to scra scrape graffiti off of buildings, vandalized in the previous two days riding there. And then as darkness fell, he wandered the streets alone without any connection to e either the home or business owners who were standing in front of their properties trying to protect them or to any of the groups organizing to resume the protests that night. Eventually, he joined a group of armed men standing in front of one business. He brought along his own semi-automatic rifle. He did not know the names of any of the men with whom he stood, with which he stood, nor did he know the name of the business in front of which he stood. Now, when the protesters coming down the street, seeing the armed men, wisely decided to just keep going past that stretch of sidewalk, Rittenhouse got bored. So he started wandering around the streets himself. And eventually, the sight of one armed white guy walking by himself through the crowds drew attention. One man tackled him from behind. A second one started beating him with his skateboard. Now, that might sound funny until you realize that skateboards today are about four feet long and they're made from hardwood. A third man, himself carrying a pistol, got involved. And Rittenhouse opened fire. He killed the first two and took a significant chunk of the upper arm off of the third man, the one with the pistol. No counter cause, no counter protest makes this acceptable. God does not honor this brand of vengeance. The time has come for this preacher to come clean. I find myself trapped in the middle, stuck between two enraged groups stoking their passions on social media and broadcast television and radio. People I have known for 45 years People who have always been thoughtful and kind and sweet are now raising their voices and waving their arms while calling the other side names that my salty Grandpa Riggins would never have uttered in polite company. What is happening to us? What is going on here? My reading of the Bible, my theological training, and my prayers make it impossible for me to support either side. The people in the streets of DC and Kenosha, both left and right and everywhere else, are extreme examples, but they represent where we are in the process of becoming as a nation, and I can no longer remain silent. A pox on all their houses. The Holy Spirit of God is speaking to us. I hear it calling us to have the strength not to do. I hear it calling us to have the strength to be grown-ups. I hear it calling us to have the maturity to listen to people with whom we disagree. I hear it calling us to let God do God. Let God judge people. Let God guide our, us. Open up our hearts and minds. I see real evil at work in the world today. I'm not against fighting it. I think we have to. But how is the question? We must permit God to take care of separating the sheep from the goats. Meanwhile, let us do us. In the words of Julia Jackson, mother of Jacob Blake, the man shot seven times in the back by the Kenosha police, I quote, we really just need your prayers. I am asking, I am begging everyone in Wisconsin and abroad to take a moment and examine your heart. 
do my son Jacob justice on this level and examine your heart. We need healing. We need healing, not revenge. Let us find the spiritual strength to become more like Jesus. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let each one of us find the strength in Christ to become a part of the healing. Let us pray. Lord our God, we pray that you would give us the spiritual strength to continue walking down the path you have chosen for us. We are tempted, Lord, to stray from it. We can become angry. We can lash out. We ask for your forgiveness and for your continued guidance that we might find the good and that we might become a part of the healing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now in response to the word of God, as it's been read and preached, I, join, I invite you to join me in reciting a, a piece from the Barman Declaration written in response to the, uh, to the evils of Nazism in Germany. As Jesus Christ is God's assurance of the forgiveness of all our sins, so in the same way and with the same seriousness is he also God's mighty claim upon our whole life. Through him befalls us a joyful deliverance from the godless fetters of this world for a free, grateful service to his creatures. Let us pray. Oh Lord, now we come to you praying for others. We pray, Lord, for those whom we see as our opponents. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to grow in faith and in wisdom, so that we might not label them, so that we might not put them in our neat little boxes, imagining that we can somehow control them. Rather, Lord, help us to hear and to ponder. We ask that you would keep us faithful to your teachings, that we might sift through what we learn and what we hear, but not that we might judge rather that we might find the course that you have set for us and for those whom we love. We pray, Lord, for those who are marching in the streets. We ask, Lord, for safety in our nation and for a, a dedication, a, a, an ability to find common paths. We ask, Lord, that this would not be just platitude, but truth and reality. We ask, Lord, that leaders might emerge, people with vision and courage, as they have done in the past, and that they might turn what is happening into your way. Lord, we pray for all leaders, for everyone who has authority and accountability, who bears the responsibility of making choices. We ask, Lord, for wisdom and courage for these folks as well, whether they be in churches, or in schools, in business, in politics, or wherever they may be found. Lord, these days we do pray for our schools, for our teachers, our students, staff, and at every age level, Lord, as the, as the colleges are coming back, we pray that there would be restraint and ability to adhere to those guidelines which are meant to keep everybody safe, we pray, Lord, for those who, uh, many people in our church who are teachers at various levels and who feel oftentimes constrained to go, that there is a loss of joy. We ask, Lord, that, there, that the joy that they have found in teaching might be restored to them and carry them through 
so that they might go and do their calling as well. Lord, we pray for the students of all ages as well. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for those who are sick, sick in every way, in any way. And we pray for healing for them. And Lord, we pray for healing in our nation. The pressure is almost more than we can bear. We've been arguing and shut down and afraid for far too long. We just don't have it in us to be our best right now. Work with us, we pray, and with one another, with everybody. Give us the ability to get up each day and do what you've called us to do, to follow in the footsteps of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to become more like him. And Lord, in obedience to your will and your call upon us, that we pray, and according to the teaching that you gave us, we now offer this, the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. so moved, the offering plates are sitting out and as you leave you can place your offering in them. We report with joy and thanksgiving that the church is continuing to do well enough financially that we're able to meet our payroll, pay all of our bills. We're very grateful for your continued generosity and support. Thank you. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.